Hello again, and welcome back to Learning with the Fosters. We are going to work through the solutions to, based on our lecture uh, dealing with subset. Problem number one. Our job was to it correctly insert either a subset or not a subset to make each statement true, and then describe the set relations with a Venn diagram. So let's tackle the first part first. Here are our sets again. Let M equal the set 1, 2, 3 through 10. N equal the set 1, 3, 5. O equal the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And P equal the set 10, 8, 12. So let's take a look at our relations. Is M a subset of N? Well, in order for M to be a subset of N, all the elements in M have to be distinct elements within N. So let's take a look. M we have 1. Do we have a 1 in N? Check. Two, no. So M is not a subset of N. How about M with O? Well, again, M is 1. O has a 1. M has a 2. O has a 2. M has a 3. O has a 3. Now what about this ellipsis? We're going to have to translate that into elements. So based on the pattern, M would consist of the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up through 10. So 4, check. 5, check. But after that, O stops short, so M is not a subset of O. How about M and P? Well, hopefully we've noticed a pattern by now, too, that if a set has less elements than the other set, it, the longer set cannot be a subset of the other because there has to be each set in set one has to be contained in set two. So we can see right off the bat that P is not, or that M is not going to be a subset of P, but just for sake, let's walk through it. Do we have a one? No, we don't. So M is not a subset of P. Okay, how did you do on that? Let's, let's go on to N relations. Is N a subset of M? Well, in order for that to be true, again, all the elements within N would have to be distinct elements within M. Let's check. 1, is there a 1 in M? Yes. 3, yes. 5, yes, as we talked about what those ellipses would be filling in for. So N is a subset of M. Again, to reiterate, because each distinct element in N is present as a distinct element within M. So N, N is a subset of M. How about N and O? N has a 1, O has a 1. N has a 3, O has a 3. N has a 5, O has a 5. Yes, N is also a subset of O. Well, how about P? N has a 1, P does not. So N is not a subset of P. Let's check O. Well, we've already seen this combination, O and M, before. So maybe we could cheat and save a little time and just put in not a subset. No, we can't do that, right? Because we've seen where 1 can be a subset of one set, but the but not vice versa. In fact, the only way that occurs, if you remember back to our lesson, was when, yes, they are equal. They are equalities. So we have to go through and do the work. So is O a subset of M? Well, O has a 1. Does M have a 1? Yes. O has a 2. M has a 2. 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5. And we're out of elements in O, so yes, in fact, O is a subset of M. Good thing we didn't cheat. All right, how about O and N? Is O a subset of N? Well, O has a 1, N has a 1, 2, no. So O is not a subset of N. How about O with P? O has a 1, P does not. O is not a subset of P. Alright, one more combination to go with respect to P. Is P a subset of M? 
Again, in order for that to be true, all the elements in P would have to be contained as distinct elements within M. Is that the case? Is there a 10? Yes. Is there an 8? Yes. Well, it looks like we're doing good. One more to go. 12. No, that's outside of what M can, the set of M. So P is not a subset of M, despite how close it was. But every element has to correspond. So how about P with N? 10? No. P is not a subset of N. How about P with O? P has a 10. O does not. That was fairly easy. P is not a subset of O. All right. Great job on that. Make sure you go through and check your work. And if you, you missed one or a few, I'd encourage you to go back and see where we went wrong. In math, at least for me, mistakes often lead to a lot more, a much better understanding of something than if I simply get the answer correct. Sometimes it takes a little while to figure out the wrong way to do things before you realize the, the correct way to do it. All right, the next task was to let's construct or let's, let's make explicit the universal set. Again, remember, what was the universal set briefly? Well, it's the set of all, basically all the elements that are under discussion. In this case, all the elements contained within M, N, O, and P. So our universal set would consist of all the elements in M, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I'm going to go ahead and list all these out, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right. Let's see if N has anything else to add to that. Well, we could just match these, 1 and 1, 3 and 3, 5 and 5. So it doesn't, but we could also look at some of the work we've already done. Is N a subset of M? It is. So we know that there's not going to be any new information N will provide us. So we have nothing else to put in there. How about O? Well, same thing. Is O a subset of M? Yes, it is. And again, we can, we can match each individual element. Again, no new information. So our universal set still is essentially consists of the elements of M. How about P? Well, let's check. Is P a subset of M? No, it's not. So there should be, if we were correct, an uh, element in P that is not in N, and that element would certainly be part of our universal set, all the elements under discussion. So let's go through and take a check. Is 10? Yes. 8? Yes. 12? No. So let's confer with our universal set. Do we have a 12? No. So 12 is also an element of the universal set. Great job. Okay, we got our board erased. We have one task left for problem number one. We have to draw a Venn diagram to look at the uh, set relations that are going on. So let's do that. We'll start with our this rectangle representing our universal set. So again, all elements under discussion must be contained within this orange rectangle somewhere. That is our universal set. Okay, now where to go from here? Well, we can kind of experiment till we get it right, or we can look at some of the relations we already established and make kind of a game plan. We noticed that we have a number of subsets. In fact, M is almost equivalent to the universal set. So M is a fairly large set within this. So let's start, we can just draw, I color coded these. Let's draw set M somewhere over here. All right, there's set M. Now, if you looked at our relations, we noticed also that O is a subset of M. So every element within O will be contained within M. So we can construct another set all within M. Now, we wouldn't want to overlap outside of M, would we? Because that would allow for space where an element that would be in O, but it would not be in M. And therefore, O would not be a subset of M, which we already looked at and established that O was a subset of N. 
of M, excuse me. So all of O has to be contained within all of M, as O is a subset of M. Okay, we're making progress. So within the orange rectangle, all the elements under discussion will have to be included. Within the yellow uh, circle of M, all the elements of M, namely 1 through 10, will have to be included within this yellow circle, which can certainly include all the area in the purple. Now within the purple, within the set O, all the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 should be contained. So, so far we're looking like this is at least a logical possibility. See how by by noticing the subset relations, it makes these fairly easy to draw. Now we had one other subset relation that was interesting. N was a subset of both O and M. So how would we draw that? Well, it's a subset of O, so everything in N would have to be within O. It's also a subset of M, which means everything in N would have to be included in M. So we can kind of check our drawing. This makes sense. No matter what we put in here, it will be included within O, and it will also be included within M. So here we have a good picture of, I guess I should label this, this is subset, or this is set N, is a subset of O, which is a subset of M. Therefore, N is also a subset of M. So far, so good. So we have one set left, this P, that wasn't a subset of anything. It shared some common elements. It shared 10 and 8. Now, who did it share 10 and 8 with? Well, M. So here's M's sphere. So somewhere in M, there has to be some overlap where we can fit 10 and 8 in. But should we just put a circle there? Could we say that this is P? Well, that works for 10 and 8. But our problem runs into with this element 12, because 12 is not contained within M. If we did this, then we would be saying that 12 is also an element of M. See how it's contained within uh, the set M. So that won't work. But what we can do, we could put the shared elements 10 and 8 here. It's being shared by P and M. And we could continue outside of M and put our lone element 12 in. So let's go ahead and do that and then correspondingly fill in all the other numbers and see if this makes any sense. So we already noticed that 12 is the odd bird, so 12 is going to have to be in this region here. Now by doing that we're saying 12 is of course a member of the universal set. Everything we write on here will be a member of the universal set. It's also a member of P, but not a member of anything else. And that's exactly what we noticed. All right. 10 and 8, we noted are members of P and M, but nothing else. So the only space based on our drawing that corresponds to that is this area here. So we can put 10 and 8 within those spaces. That works. Now, let's kind of start from the center of the circle and work our way out. N consisted of 1, 3, and 5. And based on our drawing, N is a subset of O and of M. And so everything we put in N will therefore be included in O and M. That's a good thing based on the information we have. So we can put 1, 3, and 5. Those elements are contained within N, also contained within O, so we don't want to duplicate those. So let's cross those off so we don't get confused. We already labeled those, members of O and N, and also that's a subset of M. So we can cross off 1, 3, five. All right, we're doing pretty good. Let's keep working our way out. O. In O we have two remaining elements, two and four. We can put those anywhere within O. And what that is saying is that two is an element of O and M, but not N. That's good. And not P. That's good. And then also similarly with four. All right, we're doing pretty good. So the only elements we have left are elements 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And those are members of M, but not members of any of the other sets. So we can place those anywhere in M as long as it doesn't overlap 
with the other sets. And I just misspoke, eight and 10 were already uh, used. They do overlap with P. So we're left with elements six, seven, and nine that are unique to M. So we can place those anywhere as long as they don't overlap with any of the other sets. So six, seven, and drop my chalk. Nine. All right, we've used up all the elements. We've gone through individually and looked at each element and make sure they correspond to the proper sets. And of course, everything is still within the universal set. So we worked out pretty good. And this is a nice way where we can look at this and see from a visual, a pictorial perspective, the set relations that are going on that we had noted and denoted previously. So great job on that. Let's do the same thing with problem two. Problem number two, same directions. Correctly insert a subset or not a subset notation to make each statement true and describe the set relations with a Venn diagram. All right, so let W equal the set of all elements X such that X is an integer between 30 and 36. So let's write this out using set braces, so that'll kind of help us see. So W will consist of the elements to be, the condition is it's an integer between 30 and 36, so that means our endpoints, so to speak, are 31 and 35, and an integer in between would be 31, 32, 33, and 30. Four. And again, if you're like me and you're getting a little bit tired of kind of the gray area of our borders included or not included when we're talking about between and greater than, that drives me crazy, stuff like that. Shortly, we'll be, we'll be becoming much more precise with our language and some symbols that we use to make it very crystal clear what's included and what's not. But at this point, we're kind of st still sticking with this uh, loose language, uh, so to speak. But the time is coming where we will tighten it up. Okay, set y is the set of all elements x such that x is an integer less than 40 and greater than 30. So let's again, like we did with w, do the same thing for y. List the elements utilizing set braces. All right, so it's an integer less than 40 and greater than 30. So 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and will we include 40? No. Okay, so there is our set Y. Set Z is the set of all elements X such that X is an integer between 31 and 35, and it's also even. So let's list the elements in set Z, and we'll also note shortly that Z is not a good letter to denote a set. Um, we'll talk about that in a few lectures, but for now it's simply Z. Okay, so it's an integer between 31 and 35. Let's just do that. 32, 33, 34, not 35, but our second condition, and it's even. So that eliminates 33. Let's take that out of there. So our set Z consists of 32 and 34, a nice little convenient set. I hope this problem helped you to, pra to practice reading and understanding set building notation. All right, so our task is to correctly label, to insert the correct uh, symbol, the correct notation to make these statements true. So let's look at W and Y. We want to know is Y a subset or is W a subset of Y? If that is the case, all the elements in W have to be elements in Y. Let's check it out. So W, 31, Y, 31, 32, 33, 34, 
35. All right, so W is a subset of Y. How about W with respect to Z? 31 is in W, it has to be in Z? No, it is not. So W is not a subset of Z. Let's look at Y. Is Y a subset of W? 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36 is not contained in W. So Y is not a subset of W. And we noted that W was a subset of Y, so in order for the reverse to be true, they'd have to be equal, and we can see that they're not. All right, how about Y and Z? 31? No. Y is not a subset of Z. Let's check out Z and W. Is Z a subset of W? For that to be true, again, all the elements in Z will have to be uh, elements within W. 32? Yes. 34? Yes. Z is a subset of W. How about Z and Y? Are all the elements contained in Z distinct elements in Y? 32? Yes. 34? Yes. So Z is a subset of Y. Excellent work. Now let's tackle drawing a Venn diagram. All right, one task left for problem number two. Let's construct a Venn diagram. So again, we'll stick with our way we've been doing this. Here is our universal set. All the elements must be contained within that. Now, let's use some of what we learned with, our, with problem number one to make this very simple for us. Let's look for subset relations before we even look at the numbers and try to just play around with it. Remember the last problem, we noticed that when there were things that were subsets, it made it fairly easy to draw, that we knew there would be circles within circles. So here we notice a few subset relations. Namely, W is a subset of Y, Z is a subset of W, and Z is a subset of Y. Almost tripped over our dog there. Okay, so Y appears to be based on this, and we can look at the numbers, the largest of those. So let's start with a fairly large area for set Y. Now what is a subset of Y? Well, W is a subset of Y, and Z is a subset of Y. So what's next? Well, there's other piece of information that Z is a subset of W, lets us know that Z will be inside W, so W would be the next largest one. And again, we can see that with our elements listed. So within set Y, we'll have a set W. And again, we don't want any part of W going outside of the boundary of set Y, because that's not the describing accurately the sets we have. So here's set W and a subset of both Y and W, in that case it will be inside of W and still inside of Y, is Z. So we can again construct an area Z within W. So Z is a subset of W and Y, and W is a subset excuse me, of Y, and all, of course, are subsets of the universal set. Now, problem number one, we had the additional interesting mark where there was an element or there was a set that wasn't a subset of any of the others because there was an element that was an outlier with all the others. That's not the case here. We have all three of our sets accounted for. So this picture in a way is simpler, a simpler version of problem one. And once we look at the subset relations, it becomes fairly easy to, to construct, I think. So all that's left is to put in the numbers. So within Z, 32 and 34, now, based on our picture and our discussion so far, we know these elements will also be contained within the other two sets. So let's just to keep track, mark them off so we don't repeat. 32 and 34, we don't need to worry about them anymore. That almost rhymed. W, 31, 33, and 35 should be elements distinct to W as opposed to Z, but still elements that within Y. And of course, that's what we see, so we can put 31 33 
And what was the other? 35 with NW. They're not elements within Z, but they are elements contained in Y as well. So our picture is matching nicely. And what is left are the elements that are unique to set Y. 36, 37, 38, 39. So those can go anywhere in the Y region. 36, 37, 38, and 39. Okay, all elements are accounted for. They are all contained within the universal set. And they all correspond correctly with um, everything we have looked at beforehand. So here is our Venn diagram describing the set relations that we already looked at when we wrote them um, using brief notation. Okay, now leading into problem number three, which involves the empty set. Let's take a little bit of a moment while we have a Venn diagram up here to say, you know, where would we put an empty set in a Venn diagram? Well, remember, the empty set is a subset of all sets. So take any set, in this case, let's just take Y, the empty set will be a subset of Y. Well, where on here would that be represented? Well, really, all the space in Y where we don't have a number. It's a subset of Y, but containing no elements, so it will not contain 36, 37, 39, and 38. So this could be a representation of the empty set. Now, don't take this too far because these are pictures, and, and try not to think of these like atoms floating around in space. But if Y is representing a set, and of course the numbers are representing the elements, then the set containing no elements, a subset to in this case Y, we could use this as a picture representation for what the empty set would be. Now also that kind of lets us know that there's nothing intrinsically right about placing these elements anywhere within this field, and I'm using that term very loosely. So we could put 38 over here, over here, up an inch, to the right a half an inch. There's nothing about this spot, other than the fact that this spot corresponds to the correct set relations. That is, it is a part, it is an element of set Y and not an, uh, and not an element of set W or Z that makes this space correct. So I hope that kind of helps uh, you as you go that you're wondering, like, well, could I put 37 here? Or down here, how, you know, why did he put up there? It really doesn't matter. It's the space, it's the relation of the sets that make a difference here. All right, problem number three. Let B equal the set one, two, three, ellipsis up through 10. We're going to be dealing with the empty set. So our first question is, is the empty set a subset of set V? If you recall our discussion, that based on even our quite informal definition of sets, and subsets, we could see that the empty set was a subset of all sets. So, of course, the empty set is a subset of set V, just like it is all sets. So the empty set is a subset of V. And if you remember the other notation that we mentioned about the empty set, we also uh, noted this notation. Remember, it's like our sets, like set V, with the various elements, but the empty set was the set that contains no elements. So there's nothing to compare over. So the empty set is a subset of V. Another kind of clarifying uh, remark on notation in general, but also specifically to the empty set. Notation is something that we're using to to represent something else, right? So there's nothing written in, you know, there's nothing fundamental to the, the, the innermost workings of the universe that says this has to be the symbol to represent the empty set. But it is an accepted one, so therefore it's useful in communicating to other people talking about the empty set. And the reason I say that is that there's actually quite a number of, I can think of three off the top of my head, other notations that are used for the empty set at times. Uh, I've only presented two, and I think they're for what we're doing in math are probably the two most common ones that we'll see. But just so you know, there are other ways to denote the empty set if you come across it and if you're doing further reading or anything. Um, these aren't the only two ways. And notation itself 
is something that we, we decide. We say this is going to represent, this is going to be shorthand, this is going to denote whatever it is we're talking about, in this case the empty set. So just a little qualifying remark, probably not relevant, but just in case you do come across other notation or you do some extra reading, and it's something to think about with notation in general. But the two that I presented and the two that we'll stick with, with for this pre-calculus course are the zero with the slash and uh, the, the empty braces. And so yes, the empty set is a subset of set B. All right, next question. Is B, is the set B a subset of the empty set? Well, for that to be true, all the elements in B would have to be present distinct elements in the empty set. We know there are no elements in the empty set and there are elements in V. Therefore, this is not a subset. The empty set is, or excuse me, V is not a subset of the empty set. In order for that to be true, there'd have, there's a one in V, there'd have to be a one in the empty set. There is not a one, there are no elements. Okay, now this one, this may have caused a, uh, eyebrow raise, it certainly is an interesting one. Is the empty set a subset of itself, of the empty set? Well, we already noted that the empty set is a subset of all sets. So yes. Also, we noted these are equal. Remember the way for something to be equal in this sense means that set one is a subset of set two and sub and set two is a subset of set one and equality. And that again is the case. So based on that, we know that the empty set is a subset of the empty set. Also, we could compare elements. If this is set one, the empty set, here is set two, the empty set. Every element in set one would have to be an element in set two. Well, there are no elements there are no elements, it's a subset, it works. So the empty set, even though it's not entirely as intuitive as some of these others, are, or excuse me, the empty set is a subset of the empty set. I almost did a schools is the nation's backbone. So the empty set is a subset of the empty set. Now, let's not confuse this with, that doesn't mean that the empty set is an element in the empty set. Remember, by definition, the, set, the empty set contain, it is the set that contains no elements. So while this is correct, the empty set is a subset of the empty set, this is not correct. The empty set is not an element of the empty set. This is wrong. This would be correct. The empty set is not an element of the empty set. The empty set, in fact, is the set that contains no elements. But this is correct. The empty set is a subset of the empty set of itself. All right. Now the last, the fun one. I think we'll have fun with this one. Did you guys like this? You know a little bit more about uh, our residents, the Casa de Fosters. The goal was to construct a Venn diagram describing the set relations between the denizens, or the residents, uh, or the members of Casa de Foster, our little place, based on the following information. So our Venn diagram is going to have to contain and do the best we can to describe the relations of the various sets that we can, that will kind of compose uh, based on the information we're given about the Foster residents, or Casa de Foster. So we, Casa de Foster consists of humans, and pets. The humans consist of one male, myself, one female, my beautiful wife, Damaris, and a lot of pets. And these are just the ones we're mentioning. But there's indoor pets, there's outdoor pets, although sometimes that line is not crystal clear, it blurs somewhat. But the indoor pets, we have cats, we have three males, three females, we have a dog, one female, in fact, some of these folks have made appearances in our videos already. Outdoor pets, we have a goat, Valentine, a female. We have chickens, again, for simplicity's sake, I kind of approximated, four males and 20 females. We've got a bunch of new little baby pollitos, pollitos. So, but for our purposes now, we have four males and 20 females. So we want to construct a Venn diagram 
that will display all of this information. We don't want to lose any of this information. And based on how I kind of wrote this, it kind of helps us to see there's kind of breakdowns. There's kind of, or what the terms we've been using, there's sets kind of implicit just by the way I wrote this. So let's organize this information. And this isn't, there's a number of ways one could do this, obviously. But let's work through it together and show you kind of how my brain works, how we could take this information, we can organize it, and then we can construct a Venn diagram that really uh, is a good picture of all the different relations between these various sets. So I think this will be fun. So let's start with, to me, I think the easiest thing I notice. There's kind of two broad groups. There's humans and there's pets. Let's start with the easiest group, the humans. Let's construct a set of all the humans, or the set uh, that contains all elements X such that X are the humans in the foster residence. So what are we going to name this set? Well, we can name it anything. Remember, we just talked about denotation. Uh, but let's, let's make it simple. I, I would use an H, a capital H, for humans. So let's say H is the set representing humans. Well, what are the elements? We have myself and Damaris, a male and a female. So we could write J and D, but that could get a little bit confusing. Rather, instead, let's use some of the notation that I briefly introduced during the lesson. Let's keep it simple. Let's keep H corresponding with H. So if this is the set H, let's call all the denizens within the humans, that'll be all the elements in our set, let's label them lowercase h's. So there's two humans. So the set H consists of the elements H and H. Oh wait, but we can't have two of the same, and in fact this is not saying they're one and the same. So yes, Demaris is going like this, I was thinking, are we almost out of time or what? But she's absolutely right. Let's label this human H sub 1 and this human H sub 2. So now they're distinct. This is not the same human as this human. And it makes it pretty simple to label. Great job, Damaris. I love you in so many ways. All right, the next set, let's construct pets. Well, let's use, how about a capital P? So P will be the set of all pets. Oh my word, there's a lot of pets. There's cats, dogs, goats, chickens. Oof, maybe, you know, we'll come back to this, but let's notice something that pets can first be broken down into indoor or outdoor. So let's just say for now, we can expand on this, but let's say for now, pets consist of all of the indoor pets and all of the outdoor pets. But what we notice is this is not a single element. This is not a single element. In fact, there's a lot of elements in between. So we'll have to come up with a set. They're sets in and of themselves. So we'll have to have a set I, we'll call for indoor, and we'll have to have a set O, we'll stand for outdoor. So let's look at those, let's try to construct those. And whatever they end up being, those are the elements in set P, or the set for pets. All right, so within indoors we have cats and dogs. Ooh, kind of the same thing. We have sets within sets. Ooh, it almost sounds like subsets, which of course they are. So for now, before we deal with the cats and dogs, let's for now just say the indoor uh, pets consist of the set, we'll say C for cats. So we'll have to have a set C and the set D for dogs. So we'll have to have a set D for dogs. All right. Well, let's see if we can work those out. Okay, now we're finally down to our cats have, we have, a, we have a, a certain number of cats. Now we could see sets between females and males, but let's for now just, just label the cats all together. So again, let's use Damaris' great suggestion and simply label each of the cats. We have three male, three female, so that would be six cats. We'll label these cat sub one, cat sub two, cat sub three, cat sub four, cat sub 5, and cat sub 6. So there's our set of all of our cats. And just so you know their names, we have Woodstock, Snowflake, Archimedes, Esperanza, 
Sophia and Achilles. So they're all there, all accounted for. All right, dogs. We just have one dog. That makes this easy. So we'll simply label this lowercase d. But just keeping in what we're doing, we'll just label it d sub 1, even though it's the only element within d. All right, so now we can look at our indoor animals consisting of these two sets, and we have all the elements for those. So if you wanted to go ahead and replace this with the actual elements, you could. I won't for time's sake. But we now see the elements that consist in set I. That's great. Let's do the same thing for set O, or the outdoor animals. We have a goat and chickens. Okay, a goat. So for now, we'll again just say a set G for goat. And chickens. Now, how are we going to abbreviate chickens? We already use C. We don't really want to use two letters. C-H. Well, let's use this. We love using Greek letters. We can use the Greek letter chi, which is like a C-H. can make the K sound like character or ch. So we'll use the Greek letter chi using a lowercase to represent chickens. C-H. So we'll have a subset chi, or we can think of C-H. And that will represent our chickens. So let's let's uh, build these sets. Our goat, hey, it's kind of similar to our dog. We just have one. So we'll say goat, but we'll keep in uh, common notation, G sub 1. All right. How about our uh, set chi, or chickens? We have, ooh, 24 chickens. So we're going to have... Chi sub 1, Chi sub 2, Chi sub 3, and do you guys really feel like writing all these? I don't. What can we do? Oh, yes, ellipses. We'll go ellipses out to Chi sub 24. Okay, so now we have the information necessary to complete our outdoor set. And again, we could simply uh, build this set rather in terms of set G and set chi. We could list all the elements in it. So uh, set O would consist of G1, chi 1 through 24. We won't do that again for time's sake. But we're getting organized. Look, we've got a list of sets that are accounting for almost all the information up here. The only information we're lacking is the sex relations, the male, the female. And so since we weren't given specific names, simply a count of how many male and how many female, that's all the information our Venn diagram needs to consist of. So it can be as simple as, as saying one of our elements in our set H will be male, one will be female. We can denote either H1 or H2 as male or female as long as we have one of each. Same thing with the chickens. We just need at least four to be male, the other 20 females. So we can kind of keep that in the back of our mind. You can color code that if you want it. Well, let's do that, I guess. Let's say, uh, let's, let's do, I think we have less males overall, so we'll color code the males with red. So one human has to be male. So H sub 1 we'll, we'll label as male. Uh, our cats, we have 3 and 3. So we'll just do the first 3, C sub 1, C sub 2, and C sub 3 are male. And our dog is female, our goat is female, our chickens, we just have four males. All right. So we've got all the information up there. So now our task is to construct a Venn diagram. Okay. So to start, to construct our Venn diagram, let's quick look through this and note some of the set relations. We won't go through every possible combination like we have been doing, but let's note some of the notable ones. First thing I observe is we actually have two other sets going on here, and I'm sure you've noticed something similar, namely male and female. So let's, keeping with our simple notation, let's have M be the set of all the males, and F, don't think we have any F yet, F be the set of all the females. Now, for males, we would end up going through and putting in the elements H1, C1, 2, 3, Chi 1, 2, 3, and 4. Not too bad, but when we get to the females, we're going to have a lot more elements. So 
because we color coded this, what we could do um, notation wise, and again, remember our discussion about notation that they're really conventions we're putting on as long as we understand what they're representing. And actually, we could get into an interesting medieval discussion on what exactly uh, something was by name, but we, we'll avoid that for now. But what we could do is we could simply say that the males, to save us time for writing, are all of the elements that are red. So M is a set of the males, which is, consists of all the elements that are in red. We could do something similar for females, all the elements that are white. So we've got those two sets as well. So let's notice some set relations. Based on our drawing, we already noticed some kind of built in. For instance, the set P of pets contains a lot of other sets underneath. Or in other words, those sets are subsets of P. So chi, g, d, and c are all subsets of p. i and o are subsets of p. c and d are subsets of i, the indoor animals, as we've kind of noted. g and chi are subsets of o, which are the outdoor animals. o and i are subsets of P. So there's a lot of subset work, subsets going on. Also, with our new male-female sets, if the males are everything in red and the females are everything in white, are there any sets up here that are entirely white or red? If so, then they would be a subset of the respective male or female. Well, the chickens, we've got some red, some white. So they're not. The dog, we have one dog in white, a female, so our set D is a subset of our set F. Our set G, our goat, is a subset of set F as well. They're all female. So based on those subset relations, and we could go through it and label them and, or write them all on the board, which, which perhaps we should, but, but we won't. But we've kind of talked through some of the subset relations. Let's now attempt to construct a Venn diagram where we can look at it and see all these different relate sets and subset relations at play. And we don't want to lose any of the information. So, of course, the place to start, we can construct our universal set, which are all consists of all the uh, elements under discussion, which in this case, there's quite a few. So all of these will have to be up here in some way. And if this is the universal set, if we put this in, if we translated this more to word phrases, the universal set essentially represents all the denizens of Casa de Foster, which is what the original problem was asking us. So the universal set, this is going to give you a picture of all of the inhabitants that we have the information for um, at Casa de Foster. So, how to start? Well, of course this picture can look somewhat different. Um, depending on how we do it. But the way my brain works when I look at this, when I see this, I see there's kind of two, there's, there's, a, there's groups of certain sets in which there are a number of subsets with. For one, there's clearly the group, the set P, with a number of subsets underneath that, distinct from the set H, which is the humans. Um, also, we have the male and the females, kind of a dichotomy that way. Every element will either be male or it will be female. Every, every element will correspond to one of those. So the way I would look at that is let's, I don't have enough colors to color code all these, so we'll, we'll stick with white and see if we can make it work. At least male and female, we can stick with colors. So what I would look at is every element is going to be either be male or female. So let's kind of divide this into areas. This will be set M, male, and this will be set F, female. Now, of course, these don't overlap because uh, all the information we have, they're either one or the other, not both. So no elements should contain uh, should, should be present in both of those sets. Every element will either be an M or it will be an F. So that's kind of an obvious way to break it down to start with. Another obvious way is the set P, pets, 
versus set H humans. Now, set H is much smaller than set P. Remember, if we were to list all these elements, every element here outside of H1 and H2 would constitute set P. So let's draw a small, well, we can use purple area for the humans. Now we have one male, one female, so we'll want it to cross over into both of these. So if this were set H, the humans, we have a spot for, this would be H1 and H2. H1 would be, a mem would be an element in the set H and an element in set M. That works. H2 would be an element in set H and it would be an element in set F. Perfect. So we've gotten that taken care of. Now set P will, will, should look something similar. We'll want P to extend into both male and female. As we see there are male and females in, in, uh, present in all of set P. So let's draw something kind of like we did for H, only much larger, and have this area be set P. In other words, the pets. Are we doing okay so far? Excellent. So we've got some workings. We can see this pretty clear right now. Male, female, pets, humans. So in set P, we already noted a number of subsets. Uh, notably, set I and set O. Now those are kind of like male and female. You're either, if you're in set P, you're either in set I or you're in set O. Although in practice, some of our animals are indoor and outdoor, but based on the data we have, they're either indoor or they're outdoor. So let's construct something similar that we did with uh, male and female within set P and F. But within P and F, or excuse me, within P and I, we have again both male and female, so we we'll want to straddle both sets M and F. We want to allow the elements to either be in M or F. So we can, um, we can label this set uh, I for the indoor animals. This allows all, notice all the indoor animals will be within the set P. It's a subset of P. No chance of it interacting with set H. And there is ample spot for all the indoor animals to be within either set M or set F, depending if they're male or female. And I'm out of colors. We'll have to use another white one to represent, or we can use orange again. Again, that's the universal set, but we'll use orange to do the same type of thing for outdoor animals. Okay, notice the beauty of this again. We have a spot, if you're in set O, you're not going to be in set I, but you will be a subset of set P. You can be in either, the elements can be uh, in set M or set F for male and female. All right, we're getting a lot of information. We've, we've accomplished dealing with all of these broad sets. Now, the more the sets in which we've listed the individual elements, we kind of have a working map where we can go through and place these, I think, fairly easily. We've kind of got the constructs, it's like we built the scaffolding of our building. Now to go in and finish it off, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory, I think. So set C, our cat, set C is a subset of I, and we have elements in set M and set F. So if it's a subset of set I, and we've got elements in both, we will have, we could mark our cat, like that. This is set C, in which case elements C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3 would all be within this region. Elements C sub 4, C sub 5, C sub 6 would all be within that region. You look at element C sub 5, for example, it is uh, an element within the set C, which is an element within the set I, P, and F and of course, the universal set. We're doing pretty good. We have located our dear cats with the correct spot where they should be without losing any information.
Well, let's do the same thing again for our other indoor animal, our dog. Now, this is a little bit different than the cats. We have one element, first of all, and it is female. So our dog, or D1, the element D1, will have to be in the set D solely in set F, not crossing over to set M. So we can put, this can be our set D, and which the lone element is D1, or our dog, Sable. Excellent, we've got our indoor animals with set D and set C are subsets of set I, which is a subset of set P. We've got them properly where we can allow for the elements to either be in M or F, respectively, based on the information that we have where they should be. We're doing pretty good. Taking care of C and D, are, which are the subsets of set I. Well, what are the subsets of set O? Well, we have set G, our dear goat, and set Chi, our chickens. So, set G, G and Chi will have to be within set O. And G is like our dog, set D, it's unique, it's one element, and it is only female. Excuse me, so it'll only be an F. We don't want any of set G going over into set M. So, we can do similarly to what we did with set D, and this is set G, our, our goat Valentine, there's where she is located, a subset of set O, a subset of set P, and a, and a subset of set F. Excellent. How about our chickens? S set Chi. Well, set Chi we have, we need to allow for the elements to be both in set M and set F, and it is a subset of set O. So, if we go like this, Wait, our uh, subset of set O, chi, and we allow for the elements to be in M or F respectively. Namely, chi sub 1, 2, 3, and 4 would be in this region, and chi 5 through 24 would be in this region. So we'd have a lot of elements clustered right in here. All right. Are we missing any information? We've got our sets M and F labeled. We have a, been able to fit in all this information into a picture that once we understand it, it really gives a very good example of what our original task was to describe using a Venn diagram the denizens, the residents of Casa de Foster. We can look at this once we've uh, determined what each set is and kind of taken a moment to orient ourselves to have a very good picture of the relationships between the various sets that we constructed and see how they relate to each other through the idea of subset. I had a lot of fun with that problem. I hope you did as well. Look forward to seeing you next lecture as we will continue our discussion regarding sets and subsets and their relations among them. See you then. Thank you for learning with the Fosters. This is a friendly reminder. Remember that these courses are not for free. For information, of the cost of the of the lessons and how to pay please visit our website thank you so much for being with us